Welcome to Responsible Chicken Breeding. Y'all should see Jim in the back bouncing his head around to that song. <laughs> did you? That, it says, "Hey Tom, did you grab your standard?" I got it my. Says, grab your standard. I got. I got about six sitting here. How, which ones do I need? <laughs> <laughs> Hi Beth from North Central Arkansas. Normally, oh wow, Blake. Oh no. Seth. Hi, Jim and Karen. Seth's on there about every week. I know I'm not supposed to comment on these people. We need to start greeting these people and saying hello to them. Say hi. I don't care. Yeah. And then, and um, wow, what a name. BA from Germany. That's the one you got the email from. <laughs> and Seekers Stead. Yes. Cool. Very cool. Um, yeah, it says grab your standard. Doesn't it say get a cup of coffee? Yep. I wonder who water. does that. I got water. I've got a bottled water. This guy says, my name is Ben. I love your show. Where are you from? Oh, Ben's well, the guy. From from, oh, he's from Germany. Yeah. Ben, I was in Germany. Uh, actually, you're in Germany. So it's it's late at night for you. Maybe. You can put him to sleep. <laughs> Service on oh my gracious ben we'll keep you awake <laughs> we will keep you awake this show is going to be a whole lot of fun but you know i was thinking i bet it's at least probably nine maybe nine hours later for ben but um i normally watch later nice to watch live for a change coffee and standard in hand <laughs> <laughs> cool bath where do you live bath Beth uh, and Seekerstead. That's a cool name. I wonder. There's a story. Oh, from Tennessee. There's a story behind every one of those names. <laughs> there really is. Just like, you know, I used to. Uh, oh, from Tennessee. Cool. Um, well, I saw. Oh, I see. Oh, I got to read the whole thing. Are but I remember to... Karen. Yeah. <laughs> now you need to stop looking at the comments. No, I'm <laughs> I remember one of my first names when I was uh, a teenager, and I loved raising Plymouth Rocks. So I called the name of my farm Rockabye Chicken Farm, like rocks, and it Rockabye. It was yeah. cool. It was fun. Dead Game Boxing. Hello from Louisiana. I've judged chickens down there in your neck of the woods. Been a while, though, since... COVID. But anyways, we got a lot to talk about, Karen. We're going to talk. I'll tell you what, all of you who are listening, uh, I think this is going to be an extremely valuable show because we're going to talk about, and there's a lot of people like this. It's like, what, I, I, I think it's the most asked question. What, I get a gazillion emails all the time. What breed, what chick should I get? What breed should I use? They don't tell me where they live. They don't. Anyway, so this is this will be a very, very helpful show. What a cool name, Jim. <laughs> I think he liked your rockabye. Rock oh, rockabye. That's great. That's very good. Ben, we need to stay in touch, buddy. I, 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 I may end up in Germany. We need to come look at chickens together. So, Karen, you want to up for a road trip? Um, no, we've talked about this. I don't have a passport, and you certainly can't get one now. They're so far behind. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. They really are behind. Yeah. I know people waiting for them. We need to get going on the show. We got to tell people. People are wondering, how in the world do I select what chicken I should get if I want to start breeding or start raising chickens? So uh, let's do it. It's, uh, it's a deep dive. Here we go. Now you got to remember, Karen. We only have one hour for this, and normally I could teach on this all day long. So you'll have to keep me honed in, and so we can kind of help these people out. Okay. By the way, I love our listeners. We got listeners. That's so cool. All over the U.S. and Germany, and wow. Yeah. In Arkansas, Beth's from. Didn't she say Arkansas? Arkansas, yeah. Tennessee. Yeah, and she, Beth, you, you live, you don't need our help. You got Mr. Tyson, and there's Shaggy. Mr. Shaggy made it. All right, 
Let's do it, Karen. Give an overview of kind of what we're doing today. All right. So um, Jim has no idea what's coming up on the slideshow. So I'm really testing him today. So we'll see. So uh, picking a breed, it's about what's your mission? What are you trying to accomplish, right? Where do you live? That kind of stuff. And then I added this bottom one to be squishy. So what's your passion? How much of a challenge are you looking for? And how long do you want to take doing it? So... Ah, those are all, so far you've done really well on this uh, slideshow, but so we're talking mission first, right? Yep, let's do you it. You want me to jump in here? Yep. All right, cool. So listen, all of you, because this will be so helpful for you and you can share this with all of your chicken friends. You can even share it with your non-chicken friends because, you know, there's always someone asking, how do I decide which chicken, ducks, geese, turkeys, whatever, what should I get? So um, I like using this word mission. Um, and what I mean by that, well, is the whole idea of what are you aiming to accomplish? What are you aiming to accomplish? What are you, you know, I, I tell people when I'm teaching a seminar, I say, you your mission is defined by you. If you want to do a petting zoo of two breeds of 25 chickens, then two breeds each, then you can do a, and you want to call it the old McDonald farm. Your mission is to kind of be able to let people see all the different breeds. You may only have, you know, you may only want white chickens. So really, Thinking through what are you trying to accomplish with your flock is very, very important. And then obviously, as she's got some, Karen's got some things listed here. If you're like, hey, I'm thinking meat. I need a meat chicken. And I don't want to use, necessarily use a Cornish cross or a, a Tyson chicken from Arkansas from our lovely friend there. Uh, I have no interest in doing things the Tyson way. I'm glad, Beth. Hallelujah. So so you, if you're thinking, okay, I want to do something with meat. Well, that will help you to determine what your mission is or what bird you will select based on your mission. You want to do egg production. So if you say, oh, I'm really trying to develop a, an egg. Uh, I want to breed an egg producing breed? Well, then you have to ask, do I want white eggs or do I want brown eggs? And so those are some questions that you have to answer. Am I, um, you know, the whole idea of a homesteader is, am I just raising them for me? Do I want to feed my family? Do I want to feed my neighborhood? Am I trying to start a small business? These are the types of things that I think are really, really important when you ask the question, what are you aiming to accomplish? Then, of course, Karen has to put in the list pets. <laughs> Let's have some pet chickens. I saw, Karen, you'll get kicked. I saw somebody uh, somebody posted somewhere on some chicken page this morning. They said, how's this for a hen house? And a bunch of like 40 or 50 hens are all in this immaculate kitchen walking around. Anyway, so hope you're going to do pets. That's your mission. I don't know that I like your mission, but that's fine. You, you can have. It. I heard that. Yeah, heard you that. got to define it. <laughs> and of course, exhibition is maybe you're like, I definitely want to get some birds. And uh, Jim, I want to enter them at some show where you're judging or at some show where I live. By the way, Beth, you have, I think it's the first weekend in November, you have the national show for the American Poultry Association is going to be in Arkansas. Anyway, so you kind of, that's a big deal to me. I think if in, in anyone that I'm teaching, anyone that I'm instructing, I want to say my first question, what are you trying to accomplish? And that is your mission. So where do we want to go from there, Miss Karen? Well, so I like to go look in the standard because it's easy and it's written down. So the first thing I always do is go look and see, is the standard going to tell me 
what's a meat chicken and what's a not a meat chicken, et cetera? Well, uh, first of all, you're right. And that's what we promote. It says, grab your standard. Some people have their standard. Yeah, even Beth is even, she's even stating her mission there. We don't have, man, this, this is fun. We should have Beth come on the show, maybe. Meet us. Meet okay. for us. I'll put it up so you can read it better. Here. <laughs> <laughs> Meat for us and the dog, eggs, secondary, moderately broody, occasional sales to the homesteader market, and beauty. That is a great mission statement. Who is this wonderful lady? I don't Beth know, but she, but she should get Rhode Island Red. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now she's going to think, oh, I've had Rhode Island Red, so we're going to talk about that a little bit further. But um. When we what what did you say again, Karen? I forget now. Oh, should we look at the standard? Is that where we're going to oh. find out? Well, here's the thing about the standard. Okay, is obviously the standard, and, and I mentioned this on the show last week. When you are selecting birds uh, for your breeders, I talk about standard qualities, and those standard qualities are the qualities that are in the standard of perfection. It's very simple. All right. But I also mentioned, you got to kick on that. I also mentioned you have to evaluate for production qualities. So especially specifically, well, I say for all of them, but especially for meat and egg and exhibition, you want to pay attention to production qualities. And the standard is somewhat limited. You will need to go to some outside resources when it comes to, you know, picking for uh, production qualities. Now, Karen, you did, you did tell me this and I'm reminded that these are the, in the standard you looked at, these are the only two breeds, Cornish and Nakedness, that actually referred to meat production. Is that correct? Well, well, they're the only ones that said they were primarily for meat production. Okay. You know what I mean? Like, so lots of blue ones, I would say most of them honestly said for meat and eggs. So most of them wanted to lean towards the dual purpose. But the two that basically said they were for meat production were the Cornish and the Naked Necks. They were the only yeah. ones that pointed in a very specific direction. Right. Okay. So, but there's okay. surely some more birds than that that you could look for. Oh, know, yeah. For interest. Tell yeah, me and, and, yeah. And that's where, that's where I say we want to expand beyond the standard and do some more homework on birds. And we'll kind of dive into that. This is a deep dive. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. Okay. All right. Let's go so little. then the ones listed in the standard that say they're primarily for egg production. I um, don't know that we need to read these. People have eyeballs. But Australorps, Leghorn, Spanish, and, and Conus. Why did I pick the one I can't pronounce? But <laughs> and illusions and yep. conus, the Sicilian buttercups, the barn velders and the campaigns and the lock and velders and the well summers and the red caps. There you go. Now, so, so. I will say that you also, you, so you do have breeds that are used for both white eggs and brown eggs because there's some brown egg layers and some white egg layers in here. So, and that's all part of your mission. People got to remember that. You know, I mean, I mean, so many people nowadays are like, oh, I don't buy white eggs no more. I only buy the brown eggs. And so, um, you know, that's something that you want to consider when you think about your mission is, you know, specifically when it comes to egg production. So, all right. So all right. most all of the birds in the standard, the people who wrote it think that they were great and they did great eggs and great meat. <laughs> <laughs> so these are all the ones that specifically say dual purpose. And I was a little surprised that that, that uh, was short, but then I found that most of them just called it general purpose. So when you add these two together as dual purpose, then you, you hit on more. Yeah. So. You know, um, there's so much for me to say here. So <laughs> I'm going to jump in on a few thoughts that run really deep since it is a deep dive that I think are very, very critical when it comes to um, the product or the bird that you actually pick. Okay. Here's a mistake that a lot of people make. Let's just take, um, let's talk about the Delaware. 
You may or may have not known this, but the Delaware was was first when it was first in the uh, in the marketplace, and it was being you and and went to the you know right in the early days of the standard of perfection. Steve Gribble Gravel, All right, how I'm are gonna, you? Okay, Jim, I'm going to put up some comments, but you try to keep talking. Okay, I will. But Steve, we need to have Steve on the show. Okay. I keep I I just need to call him. But anyways, um so listen. They say oh a a remember this, a Delaware when it was first developed was primarily a meat chicken. And over the last 70 years, we have turned it into a egg producing bird, an egg producer. It's no longer has a very good carcass to be a Delaware. So you need to be really careful when you're selecting your birds, especially if you go to multiple websites and it says egg production, very good. If you can't say, Karen, you know this, and I get kind of fired up about this, is you can't say every Delaware is a good uh, egg layer, is a good egg producer because it depends upon who's breeding them, and rather they're selectively breeding for egg production qualities. Now, I want to be very simplistic. Am I being simple enough, Miss Karen? Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you've heard me say this before, and I want to make sure that it's really clear. I never, if someone says, my, uh, my favorite chicken is Australorps, and I think the the you know I went to three websites and they said Australorps are the best layers. You've got to be very careful with that because it just because you've got multiple different breeding strains of Australorps, and so the best thing for you to do if you say, "Oh, I I want an Australorp because of what I've read, or I like the black color, or I like the size, I like its." you know, it's temperament. Go. You want to do your research to find a breeder who has been breeding them for egg production. I know that a rabbit trail, Karen. Do oh, you? That's, good. that's fine. Yeah. I mean, would you, does that make sense to you? And should I add anything to clarify nope. that? No. Nope, okay. That's good. Yeah. that's good. So general purpose, I'm really intrigued by this. I think that, um, you know, I'd love to sit in the room with some of the old timers because this this goes back. I don't know if this is stated this way in our modern standards, is it? Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, like, I, I was flipping through my 1996 when I picked these out, but but I mean, I don't. I'm pretty sure they didn't change it between 96 and now. So. Yeah, yeah. Because most of these will be known across the United States and around the globe to be mostly dual purpose. So I'd love to be a fly on the wall when some of the old timers were deciding, is this a general purpose bird <laughs> or a dual purpose bird? Yeah. So, but I do think, um, you know, I think you have so many birds that could meet the qualifications for your mission. You really do. And, uh, uh, and another mistake that I would encourage you not to make is say, you know what, especially if you want to breed, I'm going to try the hodgepodge variety pack from Murray McMurray with 25 different breeds. I mean, actually, I did that. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, let people make their mis let people make their own. <laughs> yeah, I, I did do that when I was a teenager. But in the long run, when you think about responsible chicken breeding. Um, you know, I don't mind, you know, Karen started with black Austral or no, actually Karen started with, with Heinz 57 backyard yep. <laughs> crazy chickens. And then, then you, when you got into breeding, remember that, where were we? I was somewhere in Raleigh and I was teaching up above some store and in comes Karen Johnston and her and her mom want to learn about chickens. So, that forever changed your life, didn't it? Just a little, yeah. And it probably emptied your bank account more than it did. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, it did. But then Karen started with black Australorps. And then she added, well, actually, there were a couple other breeds in there. But then eventually where she's landed, um, 
is with the Rhode Island Reds. So Steve, you're right. He says some lines of most breeds don't lay as well as others, and some don't have good weights either. And he is exactly right. And the whole idea is, is it's because of what people are doing and what they're evaluating their selection process on. So anyways, Karen, what else do we want to elaborate on here? Well, let me just say, so if you're, I'm going to run this backwards. So if you are wanting, if your mission is to take birds to market, then you better have some very strict meat birds, right? I mean, if you're, if you're going to start a large egg flock to make money, then using an egg leaning bird is probably better than a dual purpose bird that lays well, right? I mean, there is. Well, it, you know, we had a, a few weeks ago when we had um, uh, Anna on here, mm -hmm. they're used, she's using New Hampshire's. And um, so I don't totally buy that because in the sense of your mission may be um, to sell a New Hampshire carcass specifically to a local restaurant, or you may be only, you know, you want to use a, if you're selling eggs and you want them to be brown, you, you definitely want to use one of the dual purpose American breeds. And it just depends on the level of how many eggs are you trying to sell kind of thing. And, and same would be with the meat. And uh, so I think, um, I think I mostly just want you to just give somebody a little hint. So if you're going to do meat with a dual purpose, with a bird stated as a dual purpose, you're talking Delaware's, New Hampshire's, Plymouth, Plymouth Rocks. Rocks yeah. Meat. I mean, you, you could use a Wyandotte. Okay. Um, and a Dorking is an excellent meat bird. But here's the thing, Karen. If you get a lot of these breeds that are being sold out of the hatcheries, no one's asking for a dorking as a meat bird. So all these hatcheries are breeding them for egg production because that's what people are asking. I want a dorking that lays a lot of eggs. I don't want a dorking that has a, a nice carcass for meat. So you really got to be careful where you go to get the birds. But you can get Dorkings or you can breed them up to being a fantastic meat bird. Same with, you know, somebody mentioned uh, a Brahma or a Brahma, depending on where you live. And, and uh, you know, and so, and I can assure you, like people like um, uh, Steve's New Hamps, same with Anna's, their, their carcass, we saw pictures of those. So you you can, but you got to be very, very careful where you get them. Is that okay to say it that yep. way? Yeah. All right. So not everybody wants to make money. Some people want to. So there's some more different types. So the uh, ornamental exhibition, these are the seven breeds that are specifically listed as such. Um, and then there are a few uh, outliers that just don't tell you what they're for. So you get to... <laughs> totally decide what you want to do with those with those yeah breeds. well um yeah these are some fun breeds though they're fun to judge there you go um, yeah all right so let's get on to uh let's just go back i feel like i got lost so we're back on to location where are you where are you that make yeah so this is a huge question that everyone is asking this is where I, uh, this is probably the most common email question that I get is this is where I live. What bird will work where I live? Well, remember this talking about where you live, obviously. Um, and I'm just looking at some of, um, some of you may or may not know this, but I, I, I wrote a book. The book is done here. It is right here, but it needs pictures and graphs and so forth. So I'm looking at some of what I wrote about. When I talk about climate, here's the thing. And I talk about it early in the book, but I'm going to tie it into specifically climate. Every chicken, every breed of chicken was developed with a very specific purpose for a very specific place. Example, you know, I always joke around. I say, okay, where... Where did the Buckeye come from? We've talked about this before, but of course, 
everyone echoes wherever they're listening. Oh, the Buckeye, that must be an Ohio chicken. You're exactly right. And it was developed um, by a woman up near Lake Erie, near Cleveland, Ohio, and she wanted a chicken that would do well in the cold weather. So, you know, you say, well, where, I wonder where a Rhode Island red came from. Ha ha. California. <laughs> it doesn't take much to figure that out. So how about a Delaware chicken, right? How about a New Hampshire chicken? Well, and here's the trick one is, you know, even the, the Wyandotte, a Wyandotte chicken, you're like, oh, I don't know where that state is, but it was developed in upstate New York. The bird was built for cold weather. And so thinking about where where was this bird developed and what was it developed for is a great question to ask. Now, some of you may say, oh, there is no uh, Florida chicken. There is no Texas chicken. Well, Texas has a lot of commercial poultry. It's all in buildings, right? There is, you know, where's the Arkansas chicken? Well, you have an Arkansas chicken. It's called a Tyson chicken, right? You don't have a you don't have an Arizona chicken. Well, you, you know you, you can't domesticate roadrunners. So, birds, chickens were developed specific breeds for a specific purpose in a specific place. Now, with that being said, I'll tell you a very very cool story. Like with uh, with a buckeye, I remember when Don Schreider and and. Uh, uh, Jeanette Berenger did the Buckeye Recovery Project. And that project was in North Carolina. And I'll never forget, I don't remember if I read this and something that those two wrote or Don shared it with me, but he said, remember, even though there is a, a Buckeye chicken is from Ohio and we brought them down to North Carolina and we did a Buckeye breeding recovery project, those birds over uh, each generation, they adjusted to the heat of North Carolina. And so they actually, you know, allowed the birds to be exposed to the heat. I mean, how do you avoid that, right? When you're in North Carolina in the summer. And, and, and so what they did is that bird eventually adjusted its ability to survive based on the climate. So I say to anybody, now there are some exceptions. I mean, sometimes I remember, I remember when I was uh, mentoring some breeders with Chanticleers. Chanticleers is a Canadian. Here's another bird, specific purpose, specific type, specific place. It's the only dual purpose bird developed in Canada. It's called a Chanticleer. We wonder what that says, general purpose in the standard. I don't remember which list it was in, but that's all right. So, so, and if you find it, you can interrupt me. But it was built for cold weather. I remember when I was mentoring the same exact, exact genetics, somebody in Southern California had some Chanticleers and another breeder in Montana had Chanticleers. Well, obviously, you know where it's colder. It's colder in Montana than it is in Southern California. And I'll tell you something we learned about those Chanticleers. The Chanticleers in Southern California, the, the hotter it got, the less eggs they laid. This blew my mind. I love this statistic. The colder it got in Montana, the colder it got, the more... She laid, the more the egg, the hens produced eggs. So it's a great example in thinking about climate. You know, if you're going to bring a cold weather bird into a warmer climate, you just got to keep track of records and see how the bird does and see how the bird, you know, produces, how it grows. Um, I say this, and I say this all over the world, same when I'm in Africa and all these hot tropical places. There's really two keys when you bring birds from a cold climate into a hot climate or any bird in hot climate. Two things it's really critical for it to survive and to be productive. And Karen, you found this and, and I think you've discovered this where you live in North Carolina. And that is water and shade. 
Water and shade, water and shade. A bird that's genetically strong and you're selecting it to be productive, you know, and with good vigor. If it's got water and it's got shade, it should do pretty well. So those are some thoughts that I have on the old climate change. So your thoughts. Yeah. So I'm, I'm making everybody look at this plant hardiness zone map just because I feel like most people know their planting zone. And the, I feel like it's based on sort of the same things. I'm sure it's not because I'm not a plant person. So I'm sure it's much more technical than that. But where are the places in, I remember in that backyard class, you were where I met you, you were sort of saying that North Carolina can go either way. Like there's almost any chicken that can do okay in North Carolina. Do you, where in the country do you feel like it starts to change? Like where, Ooh, you really need to be a little careful as to what you bring into Florida or what you try to succeed with in Montana. Like, is there a, is there a layer um, for a specific zone or anything? I'm just asking in general. Yeah. So simplify that question. I'm not sure what you're asking. <laughs> All right. So it, you sort of did already that you, do you think most birds throughout the middle of the United States, do you think most birds can, can make it either way. Like, oh maybe yeah, you need to change change your infrastructure or something based on what breed you cho choose. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, I think the middle getting up. Once you start getting up, you know, in the upper Midwest or the upper Northeast, is that when you need to like worry more about cold and? Yeah, and I think with cold weather, with cold cold weather, your biggest thing is. Um, keeping your birds out of, uh, uh, wind kills birds in cold places fast. Even the birds that were built up there. I mean, obviously a Buckeye and some of these Chanticleers, they're stronger, but you know, you can put a good, strong Plymouth rock, you know, 20 below zero and it's hard on those birds. And so, you know, in any of the Mediterranean breeds, any of the hot weather birds, that, you know, come from the Mediterranean creations, they're going to, you're always going to risk, um, you know, freezing combs and so forth. And then on the heat side, you know, as we get down into Florida and uh, Texas and stuff like that, are there hot weather birds that are more likely to pass away in heat waves? Well, <laughs> well it's like I just said, you know, all your Mediterranean breeds, so leghorns, menorcas, and conas, well, those birds, all, they'll do much better in those climates. They'll they'll thrive. Okay. Um, but those are all white egg layers. Okay. They're not dual purpose birds. Now, somebody mentioned, and I agree with them that you know you can you can you can use any male chicken, you know, for meat. And so you can use leghorns and you can use menorcas or whatever. Um, yeah, I like that. Beth says even a leghorn cockerel is enough for the dog to have a meal. That's very, very true. So, so you do, you know, I think it's easier to take hot weather birds and put them in the cold than it is to put hot weather birds or cold weather birds in the heat. Because remember this too, and I've talked about it comb bigger a single comb which we're going to talk about yep i'll we're, save that thought. we're going to get there yep all right all so right. hey look we're here <laughs> <laughs> so the the two main things i think of are what type of comb does the bird have is this is it right for my area and then what shape is the bird which is sort of what you've been discussing but i think there's some more things that i don't know about so well i'll ask you about the anything else but does anything besides those two things at this point well you know just to elaborate on these two i already mentioned comb the remember the 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 temperature of a chicken is regulated through its comb so you know a big uh single comb in the heat there you go that comb on the left side of the screen that comb is a good comb for heat. Plenty of blood m running through that comb, okay? And um, uh, so I lost my train of thought. Oh, so the smaller the comb, like a pea comb or a Chanticleer, they're not going to freeze. But, I mean, that's, and that's how they, why they work so much better in the cold weather. So that's the comb. Now, when it comes to type or size, 
um, or type of the of the body type. Yeah, I want you to think, and we have some pictures that will come up here in a bit on a wine dot. When you think of a wine dot, a wine dot is a compact bird. It's it's um it's deep in its body, it's wide and it's short. The bird was built for cold weather. You know, uh, Chanticleer has people didn't know this, but a Chanticleer is supposed to have extra down. Its feathers are actually that's one of the key characteristics for a Chanticleer. If you're a breeder or you are judging them, is your is the, the and you can read this description in the standard. I mean, how awesome is that? That whoever built and developed the Chanticleer had cold weather in mind, and so they bred more down in, in the, the feathers, you know? So um, body type now, if you get a long stretched okay, out leg on. horn. Jim, you just wait. We're going to get to type in a minute. Let's go back to combs. You, All right, sorry. Um, so single combs, those are the best in the heat. Um, they have to be perhaps protected. People argue about that in the freezing climates. Um, but so when you talk smaller combs, so ro that's almost all the other ones, right? So rose, P, V. Yeah, I mean, you can get some pretty big rose combs depending on the breed okay. that that will be too big for cold weather. Okay, so but all these P others. Comb. So P combs are the smallest of the of the combs that come on many chickens. Yes, <laughs> that's true. Um, it's right. very observant of you. Oh, hush. Um, so look, we're going to get, see, I was trying to get here for the, for, so there's some Chanticleers, there's the male and female. So yeah, I can see that you're not dissipating a lot of heat through that. You are not, okay. you are not. And Shelly Oswald has awesome partridge Chanticleers. Very, very good ones. So old time farm. Does she have a website? Yeah. It's old time.farms right there on the web. On the, <laughs> on the thing. Old time.farm. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. All right. So here's. Single combs, we've made lists because that's what I like to do. So we don't have to go through them. But so there's single combs, the two pages of those. I'm gonna yeah, and that's key. That's key to all of our listeners is that make sure you um, you really want to uh, do your homework. You know, when you're picking a breed, do your homework, ask a lot of questions. And now you don't need to be like some people. It's like they've been asking questions for four years. Pull the trigger and get a bird. But anyway, so All there's right. your peak combs. There's the peak combs there. Um, and then the rose combs. Now, there's quite a few breeds that come in rose comb and single combs. So if you're stuck on wanting a leghorn or some, or a Rhode Island red, you get to pick your comb type. Um, so there's something you can do. Um, I like it. I learned today that Polish, they prefer them not to have combs at all. So I did not really understand that there was a breed that said none preferred. So, but now I know. In 1970, yeah. in 1974, five standard, it said uh, uh, the smaller the better, but lack of a comb was not a default. So it actually said it wasn't a, a disqualification, but by the right. new standard, now it says none preferred. So it went from not a default to that's what we want. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. It's called, um, yeah, chicken and then, evolution. And then here's the list of the weird combs. Um, so there's, I think. Walnut, strawberry comb. The cushion comb is on the Chanticleers. That's a great, great cold weather comb. And, and the yeah. buttercup comb, they couldn't even come up with a name, so they just called it the breed, I guess. That's a cool or, comb. Or if you around. ever see a really – and now that bird, I'd have to look where the Sicilian well, – I can't Sicilian. remember where that – Sicilian, that's Italy, isn't it? I don't know. Yeah, and I think that was – um that's a pretty good uh, – there's probably a cold season there, I would think. Yeah. You I didn't know. have – I don't have a passport, so I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now we get to shape and you can talk about the wind down again. But yeah. So, so you remember what I, I don't know if I finished my thought, but a wind dot so on the left there is that's a cold weather bird. It was developed in upstate New York. So you've got it's wide body, short bodied, and deep. It's not long and racy like the leghorn. The leghorn is a egg producer. It should, it should lay 250. 50 to 280 eggs a year where a wine dots, you know, 180 to 220. And um, because that leghorn, which is a more 
hot weather bird versus a wine dot, which is a cold weather bird, but the, the leghorn is more of an egg producer. The wine dot would be categorized as more of a dual purpose. Um, and I would say it's equal in the sense of, of um, just as can be just as much used for meat or eggs when it comes to the wine dot. There are a few birds that I say they go both ways, but generally I think dual purpose breeds they had a primary purpose, even though we call it a dual purpose bird. So we've talked about that in past shows. All right. So the so the shallowness of the body of a leghorn is what is what makes it less cold. I mean, obviously the comb too, but the Yeah, be, that bird's gonna it's gonna be much more uh Kyle. Looking good, Jim. Nice to see you live stream. Hey, he was in SBN. Do you remember him, Karen? Yeah. Yes, he's in the northwest somewhere. Yeah, yeah he was in Oregon. There you go. Wow, Kyle, how in the world are you? Look at your family. You got like 16 kids in that picture. Okay, I oh, think there's cool. two kids in that picture. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so the leghorn, smaller body, it's going to do well in in, in heat. It, it's it, it's going to stay cooler. Where a wine dot is is wide and deep and short bodied and it'll stay warm in the cold, but it'll be pretty hot. <laughs> um, all right. But there are some birds that have mixed signals going on here. So here's a coaching <laughs> that looks to me, it looks deep and short and squat bodied, but a nice giant single comb. Um, okay. It's not really a giant single comb compared to that leghorn we just looked at. Um, and what about the tiny little bantams? I mean, does if you have a bantam, that's a game bird. But well, obviously these cochins, you know, again, you've got to keep vigor in mind. But these cochins, I know cochin breeders, you know, with big standard bred cochins up in uh, up in Minnesota and Wisconsin, and and these cochins will do well in cold weather. And yes, they'll be probably err on the side of being hot when they're in hot weather, you know, and, and I was picturing, I was like, I can't imagine that bird here walking around outside. Just <laughs> <laughs> If you had shade, shade with a little bit of breeze, they'd be fine, exactly. but they will get hot. And of course, you know, modern games, they, if I'll tell you what, that's a strong bird. That to me, uh, you put that bird in cold weather. And as long as it's not, I mean, I, I've seen them survive in very, very cold weather up in Indiana and other places. I've been I've been to breeders' places when it was very cold. I've been at poultry shows when it's very cold. And I mean, modern games get the chills, but um, that's they where, uh, that's where vigor comes in, right? Look that is coming. exactly where vigor comes that's in. Jason, first time watching this great show. Sorry, Karen, I had to just say hi to Jason. Good. Um, I want to ask about the feathered shanks. So is there any climate where, like, in my in my brain, it goes both ways, right? So the feathered shanks, like, ooh, it'll keep their feet warm in the cold weather. But what if it's, like, caked in ice and snow? Like, are they more frostbite on their feet? Or Yep, yep. You, you need to watch that. Uh, you don't want, you know, definitely don't want ice. You know, um, it's just like it happens on hairy dogs. You get those snowballs or hunks of ice. The same can happen to chickens. So... Um, you, you definitely want to keep their feet dry and be careful what kind of, you know, climate they're walking in as far as wet, freezing, you know, well, there you go, <laughs> right? You got a wind out here standing on the snow. Yep. And this that's one. A tiny bit of snow for that bird. So <laughs> exactly. I just wanted to show these pictures again because they were cool, but <laughs> they're very, very cool. And, uh, wait, back up. Okay. I'm backing up. I want you to remember. Look how these are high quality silver laced wine dots and, and uh, look at their body type and how wide they are, how deep they are and how broad they are. And um, so um, these are great cold weather birds. Anyways, I could talk about these a lot because I had some when I was a teenager and I love them. And we tend to be focusing more on what are cold weather birds because there's a lot of hot weather. I mean, not hot weather, but there's a lot of in-between weather, right? So it's like you tend to focus on the extremities of these are great for extra cold and these are because it's hard to talk about all the ones in the middle. That's true. <laughs> Very um, true. 
All right, so I want to get back to property because I think this might make a little bit of difference, but I could be wrong. I've been wrong before. So like we had <laughs> Anna on here before, you know, her farm's nestled right at the bottom of a mountain. So they've got some different climates there than probably even 30 miles away. Um, um, uh, what about what about when you're talking farmland where it's just flat and out? We talked shade and that sort of thing, but is there any? No, I mean, you, no, they're flat land. Man, I wish I had some flat land. I live in the Southern Appalachia Mountains of West Virginia. And, and uh, but, um, you know, the only thing you, you know, depending on where the flat land is in the sense of you get, you get cold, cold weather in the North. And then you got the whipping wind. Wind is treacherous to any bird if it's really, really strong and really cold. So that's what I, I just like Matt struggles with in Kansas. He's got, the Oh, wind. he does. He's cold. He's got the wind. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, then, you know, would you pick a different bird if you're just looking for a few in your backyard? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just, I have a few in my backyard. Listen, so. property is huge because I'll tell you, I see some of you crazy chicken people. And I'm one of them. So I see us. You try to load your backyard and it's not good for your marriage. If, you know, the husband or the wife does not like chicken pooty all over the patio and, you know, on the steps. <clears throat> so you definitely want to very observant, very thoughtful of you, Karen, to think about, uh, um, you know, the size of the land that you have is obviously a very, very important consideration. Edgar, Edgar Mongold from our, one of our show, the show about New Hampshire's, he seems to be on a project of figuring out help or helping people figure out how to keep a couple of bantams, no matter where you live. So, yeah, well, obviously bantams are totally different. Yeah. They're totally different in the sense that you know, they're small. They're one third the size of a large fowl. So they fit a lot of places. You could put a lot of bantams back there compared to not as many large fowl. There you go. All right. How about in the woods? Birds like it there? I think woods is, but yeah, let me speak for the birds. They love it because there's shade, there's bugs, there's um, tons of great things to eat when they're foraging. And depending on the bird, there's trees you can roost in. <laughs> they love that but you gotta you know you have a whole different set of predator issues because coons and things like to climb in the trees and they hide in these in the brush so you know yeah you got a little bit harder to fence in there and stuff yeah all right so i just that was the property so the other thing to consider okay when you're at tractor supply they'll tell you birds do well in confinement or need to free range. So I do find that most of them say they do well in confinement, but I mean, does the, does the fact that, I mean, there are some breeds, right? With, if you're exhibiting that you really need to keep out of the sun or. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, exhibition is a, is a whole nother world. If you have any white on your birds, you let them be outside too much or too much sun and, and, they're going to get brassy. They're going to turn yellow from the sun. And so those are all things that you want to keep in consideration, depending. I And I take this back to your client, to your mission, you know, in the sense of, are you, is it for meat? Is it for production, meat and eggs, or is it an exhibition? And, uh, and, and so your mission will actually influence what kind of facilities you have. Well, and some people, more like me, like I, it's like to, so much of it is, I don't want them in a barn. Like that's so upsetting to me in a way that means that I will never have a white exhibition bird. <laughs> like it's just, it's a like default. You know what I mean? Like, that oh, I, yeah. if, and, and some of that's laziness. If I had to clean all those cages every day, like I'm not doing it. <laughs> well, you don't have I mean? to clean them every day. I, mean, I don't but, know what it sounds like it, but I, but I just like just knowing yourself and knowing what you are looking for. You know yeah. I mean? Yeah. So one of your core values in your mission is I want, yeah. <laughs> I want them out on pasture yeah. and I want them outside yeah. and I don't want them, you know, males 
isolated. Well, you do have some of your males yeah. isolated, but yeah, infrastructure is definitely impacted by your mission. And, and, you know, another thing about infrastructure is, well, here's, you know, these pictures of, of the one on the left is like a mobile, that's a, a, a chicken house that moves around on wheels, which is awesome. Uh, matter of fact, I, I think um, Kyle Riley used to have, I can't remember how his were, but anyway, so, so, you know, moving these that move around um, and those are your layers and, the, and maybe you're using a netting uh, to be able to keep them somewhat uh, in, in a confined area or some people just, the, the birds move with the house. That's home and they go out and they don't wander too far. And if they do by nighttime, they're all back in there. Unless of course they're interrupted by a predator. But there can be some challenges there, right? You're not keeping buckeyes in that structure. They would just leave. I don't know. I'm just I picked a breed, but I mean, <laughs> are there birds <coughs> no. that they range successfully? I mean, no, most there are the exceptions of like let's use the buckeyes. I remember many SPN folks that would use this type of housing and move it around. When the bird becomes accustomed to their house, they lay in there. They eat in there. Maybe you put the waters outside, but but home is inside. Even some of your really flighty kinds of birds, they'll wander farther, but they'll they're pretty good at coming back. You know, so I, I like this type of a system. All right. Um. All right. So this is the part that that I struggled with when I started was, you know, I was convinced that I think I believe the first breed I came to you and said, I wanted to raise was a barred Holland. <laughs> <laughs> that once I looked through all my magazines and said, Oh, these guys need help. And then you explained to me, um, okay, one, can you find one? And then two, like, do you have 20 years? Do you have all the money? <laughs> um, so, you know, there is, part of your mission has to be what are you willing to put into it and how that is that is you you said that so well i forgot i do remember when you wanted bart hollands and actually i'm mentoring somebody right now ruth dennis out in the pacific northwest and she she just got she's like i'm not doing this. she got a few bart hollands she's like i'm not doing this and they're gone so yeah that's um you know and and I mean, there's so much I could say here. What kind of ask me some questions? I want you to think about this, Karen. So, so let's just start with how challenging is a bird if you're going to breed it well. So I'm thinking about you know here's some things. Is it, what what color is it? You know what is is it a pattern bird? Is it a solid bird? And then the qual you know the availability of quality. So yeah, that was sort of the first three things that came about. So here here's a color difference. Tell me. <laughs> Right, which right. Is easier. Yeah. Well, obviously, when you are doing a, you know, uh, when it comes to color specifically, a multicolored bird is harder to breed. Now, some of them are more difficult than others when you talk about multicolored birds. Um, so, obviously, a solid colored bird, when it comes to color, is easier to breed. And and you think in terms of difficulty. What was the thing after color that you well, mentioned? Well, there? I have a question on this though, because this okay. one was easy for me that I thought, I think that's a new hamp, right? <laughs> um, that that would be harder than, you know, a solid black bird. But tell me about solid white. Is that harder than black or? No. The whites, once you get it, the white. I, I think probably a white bird is the easiest of all of them. Okay. Even more than black, because black, I want to watch for green sheen. I mean, in, in any color, you're paying attention to feather quality, but you know, obviously a white chicken. Now, while white chicken is the hardest to keep clean, if you're interested in exhibition okay. or, you know, but, but I think solid white in my 40 plus years of breeding, solid white chickens are the easiest. Okay. All right. That's what I wanted to know. So, and then we we're talking patterns. So yeah. Patterns. You know, every pattern is a little bit more difficult. I mean, Matt Hemmer here, uh, uh, one of our bestest friends, breeders out in 
Kansas, you know, we've gone through Salmon Favarels with, if you look at that male in the back, he's got, supposed to have different shades of color on his wings, across his wing bow and his wing bars. And the females, sometimes they're darker, sometimes they're lighter. And those are all breeding challenges when it comes to patterns. Now, with a wine dot, you want to get, um, you know, I wish I had the bird in my hand and I could really show you this, but you want all that color, that lacing to go all the way down around the legs and up around on the head and as far up on the neck as you possibly can. Those are all breeding challenges. And um, if you're up for it, go for it. <laughs> so, so you've got, and I think when Abigail was on, she started with the silver lace wine dots, but then, you know, because she got so good, um, like moved on to partridge and penciled, like they, do they just, they just get harder. I mean, is lacing one of the easier patterns or are they all just impossible? <laughs> um, no, they're all the same challenge. Okay. The thing is, and, and you mentioned this or you listed it when you, if you start with good lacing, you, that's called good qual high quality, then you can continue breeding it. If you start with poor lacing, then you have the challenge of fixing it. Okay. And some people like Abigail love that. And of course she is, she is the uh, a very rare exception of a great breeder of lacing. So right. Abigail's cool. All right. So then, then there's the pure. This was my attempt at availability. So there's things that make. So there are some breeds that are hard to find, right? Like just the breed at all. And then oh yeah, that, like a buff Plymouth Rock. Do you see that? There's varieties, right? That. Yeah, Can you're exactly you know? right. And I'm I'm impressed that you know which ones aren't very available. And it's it's yeah, but I was <laughs> you know the Yeah, I mean I Buff, Buff Plymouth are Rock hard. are very, very hard to find. And and uh I could probably count on three or four hands how many I've judged in the last forty years. They're hard to find. And then what else? Because those pictures are small camp. Yeah. Is that a silver campaign? Yep. You can find those around. Um, but yeah, they're a little bit more. There's a shortage of them. The the mottled houdan is an amazing production bird. And you can find those, but high quality ones, very, very hard to find. There used to be a breeder in, and she was in Michigan, I think. Um, Barb Piper was her name. I don't even know if she's still alive, but she would lay them down. I mean, color, type, production, body, everything about them, you know? So, so, but now they're pretty, pretty hard to find. What is that front or top center? Is that a Menorca? Yeah. Yeah. Another one that's, um, I know there are some very, very good Menorcas. They're probably a little bit more common than some of these others, but uh, especially the blacks, but Finding, um, you know, finding a buff Menorca or or uh, even the whites. Black, blacks are probably the most common um, and that. And then, of course, what's the other the, one? How about the silkies? Can you find a silky? Oh, my gracious. That just shouldn't be on this page. They're everywhere. Well, it was about availability. It wasn't necessarily about lack of availability. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah. Uh, all right. Well, that was basically it. I just thought I'd take you through. These are a few of the a few of the breeds from um, a previous slideshow you had. So, um, hey, let me mention yep. when I think of personalities and breed characteristics, temperament. There's yeah. a couple of huh? Temperament or yeah, there's a couple other things that I want to mention. One of those one of those is broodiness, and we've talked about that. And so, you know, some brood. Breeds were intended to be broody. Others were not. That is part of your, so in your mission, if you say, I will never artificially incubate an egg, well, then you need a, a, a broody chicken, one that will go broody. So that's a consideration. A second one is personality and, and temperament. And so if you, you know, there's birds that look, um, Temperaments vary. And and to me, one of the best ways to learn temperament is not off a website, is learn from breeders, get the birds, go see Karen's, come to my house. Let's look at, you know, try and connect with some of the different breeders and learn 
about some of the different temperaments. So, you know, there's so much more we could say, but it's like straight up three o'clock. It is. I knew I wouldn't give you enough time, but. Um. Yeah. Let me tell you this real quick. I wrote in my book, other considerations when you're picking a breed. Uh, and Karen, we can, I'll just mention them. Neighbors. <laughs> All right. Can you have roosters? You got to pay attention to neighbors. Secondly, well, and I, second, I said roosters. So you're going to have roosters. Thirdly, space. We already mentioned that. Fourth, family. I put in here in my book, I say, is your family involved in the process of selecting the bird? I mean, you just picked them, right? You didn't ask your mom or Ron, say, hey, what do you guys think? You picked it. Sometimes people say, hey, kids, let's get the family involved and, you know, make it a, a fun process. So there's a couple of other things that we might think about. So, well, I think that's it. Should we let the people go? Charlie, let hey, you go. thank you all. And I love the comments. And I'm going to, I'm really going to uh, advocate for, uh, I'm going to tell Karen, we're going to try and interact and do this a little bit more because people like putting up their comments and I like, uh, I like stopping and pausing and recognizing people. But anyways, thank you all. And uh, Lord willing, we'll see you all next Monday. Have a great day. See ya. Karen, thank you. Thank you. 